sweet. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Facebook Live and welcome to a special Juneteenth Coffee and Conversation hosted by your two at-large council members, President Brenda Jones and member Janae Ayers. Yesterday evening, Council President Jones hosted an awesome conversation entitled Black Voices on Black Lives, Perspectives and Calls to Action. This morning, member Ayers and she will continue talking about something that is very, very relevant to our current culture. That is the need for criminal justice reform. First, we will hear from Ms. Ashley Blake, the Regional Director, Midwest, for the Center uh, uh, for Employment Opportunity after Council President Jones and Member Ayers give their opening remarks. Then, Council President and Member Ayers will have a roundtable discussion with 36th District Court Judge Aaliyah Sabri, Attorney Todd Perkins of the Perkins Law Group, Harvey Santana of Michigan Government Affairs Manager for the Alliance for Safety and Justice, and Yusuf Shakur, Co-Director of Programs for the Michigan Roundtable. President Jones and Member Ayers, the floor is yours. Good morning to everyone. In case you did not know, I am your Detroit City Council President, Brenda Jones. And I am joining you and you are joining us for coffee, tea, water, whatever you're drinking this morning, your favorite beverage and conversation. I look forward to talking about fairness and sentencing and crying deterrence. Other than jail or prison. There has to be a better way other than jail or prison to be fair. As Ms. Wesley said, yesterday we had an awesome conversation and we also talked about social media as you are joining us on Facebook. And looking on, Facebook, on social media yesterday, we had over 1.7 million hits on our Zoom meeting yesterday. So I look forward to talking to you and hearing some good things. All right, so good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you. First, I'd like to thank Council President for uh, inviting me to her coffee and conversation this morning. And this is one that is uh, particularly important to me as I started the Returning Citizens Task Force for the City of Detroit over five years ago. And it is, uh, the basis is just to make sure that we are addressing the needs of those that are returning home from being incarcerated. But this conversation is so important and it's so pivotal because we need to figure out how we keep people from going to be incarcerated, the things that we need to do as a community and that we need to do just as a government to make sure that if in fact that happens to anyone, how do we make it not necessarily a pleasant experience, but one that is not uh, denigrating to anyone. Um, I am so happy to be here with so many people that work in conjunction with the task force, uh, Harvey Santana, Joe Sabri, Attorney Perkins, uh, Ashley Blake, all of you. Um, and it just gives me great pleasure to be here. So again, thank you Council President for allowing me to participate with you. Um, and I'm so excited that Ashley is here. She is a great partner to the task force and has a wonderful announcement for us. So I think Ashley, you have the floor next. So we're excited for your announcement. Amazing. Thank you all so much for having me this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, as council member Ayers said, I wanted to stop by this morning to talk about a project that the Center for Employment Opportunities is rolling out here in the city of Detroit, specifically for justice involved individuals. Um, just quick context, Center for Employment Opportunities is actually the nation's largest reentry employment provider. So we specifically uh, provide evidence-based employment services to individuals coming home from incarceration. 
And we do that through a, a four-phase model that includes job readiness training, transitional employment directly with CEO, job uh, placement, and retention services. So that's a little bit about us. Um, happy to answer any other questions, but the project I wanted to talk about today is called the Returning Citizens Stimulus Program. And this is a program that CEO launched shortly after COVID hit. Um, we understood pretty quickly that this was going to have very real and deep impacts on folks with justice involvement. So whether that was individuals currently incarcerated trying to stay safe and healthy in that space, or individuals who were coming home and going to try to navigate what has been essentially a devastated workforce system. And uh, on top of that, as the CARES Act rolled out, we also knew that justice-involved individuals would have a harder time accessing the stimulus statements that were going to be dispersed. And so with that knowledge and with the commitment to this population, we started working closely with funders around the country to work on a stimulus payment program specifically for people with justice involvement. And so what does that mean here for Detroiters? It means that we have worked with four other partners here in the city to provide three months of stimulus payments to justice involved folks. Uh, the first payment is $1,100, the second payment is $1,100, and the third payment is $450. The partners that we are working with, um, we are of course serving our own participants, folks involved in our program, as well as clients who are served through Detroit Justice Center, DLive, uh, Health Management Systems of America, and Goodwill Flip the Script program. So essentially, any folks who are connected to those organizations um, and have experience with justice involvement, particularly folks who have been recently released and are looking to stabilize in the community, have access to this funding. Um, it was important for us to uh, allow these funds to be as accessible as possible. And so we have tried not to create a lot of barriers to accessing these funds, right? We want folks to have the financial support as immediately as possible. And so um, really the only criteria that, that is present is that folks be 18 years uh, or older and that they be connected to one of these programs and be willing to stay connected to one of these programs through these three months of payment. Um, there may also be some other milestones that we help people address over these three months, whether that's financial education classes, whether that is access to skilled training opportunities, um, it's sort of up to the partner organizations what they'd like to see and how they'd like to support the folks who are engaged with them. Um, but the program is going really well. It launched for CEO participants in late April. So we will see the third round of payments to CEO participants go out at the end of June. However, our partner organizations are still enrolling folks, which is very exciting. So there's still time for folks to get connected to this resource if, if it is needed. Um, we have a one pager that I would be happy to share out more widely uh, with the council after this meeting, if that would be helpful. So we can help kind of um, disperse that into our networks and make sure people know about this funding. There is a, a particular email address where folks can send referrals and then we will get people connected to one of these organizations, either our own or the other four partner organizations. Um, and then once connected, that kind of kicks off the enrollment process, which is pretty seamless. It's, it's an intake, uh, it's an overview of the program, and then someone receives a pay card, um, a Skylight pay card, that we then load the monthly payments onto. So, that's a little bit about RCS. Um, again, happy to answer any questions or I can just go ahead and pass along a one pager and we can start um, pushing up to our networks and ensuring that folks get the support that they need. Well, thank you, Ashley, for that update. Um, we are certainly making sure that the information is accessible on the Returning Citizens uh, website. Um, and I just thank you for being a good partner with us um, to make sure that we get the information, not just the stimulus information, but just everything that CEO does out to the public. Yeah. House President? 
Thank you so very much, Ashley, as well, for sharing that information. Um, and thank you, Member Ayers, for inviting Ashley. And thank you, Member Ayers, for being here with us this morning um, as we talk about the criminal justice reform. And thank you for everything you do as well and all the people that do it with you, with your task force. Um, it's nothing like teamwork. And Council Member Ayers and I constantly work together to show that there's nothing like teamwork when you're working together. And it's not about who takes the credit, but what it's about is getting the information out to the people to make sure they know what's going on. Because when you're working as a team, we all get the credit. That's and right. that goes to all of you all that's joining us this morning. All of you are getting great credit for joining us this morning and for everything that you do. I'm going to start off with Attorney Perkins. Um, he's one of my favorite people. I see him, used to see him before I actually knew who he was. And I would say, who is this man? And what is he doing? And I got to know him and I found out he's doing a whole lot. And he's somebody important. Attorney Perkins, talk to us about what criminal justice reform is and what it's fairness in sentencing when you talk about criminal justice reform. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Council President and uh, Councilwoman Ayers for allowing me to uh, speak to your audience who is vast and growing and being educated. Um, what I can say is what criminal, criminal justice reform was two months ago to where it is today, we've moved light years. I mean, through it's almost biblical, it's almost spiritual in the sense that we always have to go through tragedy in order to realize some positive th movement. Um, and we're seeing that now as you have been, you know, our city leaders, one thing about it is you look at, and I, and I have to say this because our, our city leaders like you, Councilwoman Ayers, you know, there's not a failure to lead for leadership on a local level. And you've seen that around the country you know, where there's a failure to lead on the national scale. But as it relates to criminal justice reform, you know, it, it started with, I won't say started, because there are people who have been in the industry and, uh, you know, some people call it a cottage industry. I don't call it a cottage industry. I think it's an actual movement where, you know, the, the laws themselves are so draconian for people who are committing nine assaults of offenses. And you see, uh, the effect of laws, how it's, you know, you, you, just like with the crack uh, problem that occurred and started in the 80s, and um, it, it, it put itself in a situation where people who were sort of lower level uh, crack dealers were giving basketball, basketball score years of prison sentences, um, and whereas the higher ups, you know, so the intended consequences of the criminal um, up, updates and the criminal uh, changes in the criminal law had these effects and it, it affected minority communities far worse and far more significantly than the rest of the west of our community. But, you know, some people will say, and if you go back through history, it was the African American leaders that asked the government for something to be done about crack. And, and so that's what they did. That was what the outcome of, of it was. But now we have you know, people who are recognizing, like we used to call, we call in the uh, Obama administration, they used to call it the holder rule. Before the Senate actually changed the law and changed the sentencing guidelines, which are, guidelines are things that are used for judges to make a determination as to what an appropriate sentence should be on, a, on an objective standard. Although each sentence should be configured to the individual who is being, who's right before that court. And it should be unique to that individual and to those circumstances. But the sentencing guidelines give some kind of platform so there is at least some kind of uniformity in, in sentences so you don't see the, the gross injustices that you see. I, I saw um, on Facebook, um, there was a judge, same judge, same county down in Florida, where, and the kid is, I, I believe these are youthful offenders, the kid, one kid is 19, both kids I think are 19 years old. And I may have some of the facts wrong, but this one kid, he gets, uh, a year in the county, the white gentleman gets a year in the county. They have the same prior criminal history, which I believe was none. And then the uh, the black 
uh, kid gets, uh, what, 15 years or, or some odd change in circumstances, but that's what guidelines are supposed to prevent. So they, uh, in the Obama administration, he was the first president to go around and sit in prisons and talk to individuals about their circumstances and talk to individuals about, you know, and, move, and moving the needle with respect to reform. Now, to a certain extent, even though I'm not a fan, um, you have the, our current president who signed the First Step Act. You know, and the First Step Act is hopefully what we as lawyers feel, it is the first step in national reform on a federal level. And so as it becomes a federal, federal movement, we hope that states will follow. But you know, you have these conservative agendas that want, quote, states' rights, which means that on an individual level, we can determine whether or not we're gonna violate people's rights from a constitutional perspective. And that's me talking, that's an opinion, but I, I just believe that the, the, the proof is in the pudding. So now criminal justice reform now is, you know, a lot of people and the, and the people who you have on your panel there's, they have a wealth of knowledge in it because they're experiencing people like just what you're doing, like the, the uh, with Councilman Ayers, uh, Councilwoman Ayers, how she has been in the movement of dealing with people who are coming out of prison. So there's so many different aspects of criminal justice reform. Criminal justice reform has one aspect of how you sentence somebody in an equitable and fair manner. Then you have criminal justice reform is, what do we do with these individuals when they return to society? Do they continue to wear the albatross? Do they continue to wear that yoke of the sentence? Do they ever, you know, you, we always thought if we serve the time, then we pay the price for the injustice or the, 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 the crime that we've committed. But yet these people continue to pay these, you know, I have people, and, and, and as a business owner, because I have a restaurant in Highland Park, I never check the box. And I know you know what that is, but for your audience, you know, the check the box when people go in and they talk about that kid, young man, Rashad Brooks is, a, is an interesting story on him that he talked about getting out of jail from having served one year in jail that, you know, he was so hard for him to find a job because once he got to that box where it says, have you ever been arrested or have you ever been convicted of a felony or, or certain things? He knew what the circumstances was. He knew he wasn't going to get the call back. And that's one of the things that we have to get beyond that. And I think the city of Detroit is well is, is moving the needle in that direction of trying to get these people back to work so that we don't, you know, their options are, you know, they at least have the choice of a life of a, a crime free life, you know, and I don't want to make excuses for people who are, or, or who are violating the law. But the reality is the reality. I mean, if I'm going to get paid seven or eight dollars an hour below minimum wage because you know that's what an employer can do because you can't find any other employment anywhere else, then they, their options are limited. So it, it, it is a vast thing. Like criminal justice reform is just so you know it is. I, I mean, it's 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 overflowing. And now what we have with this movement now the powder keg has been lit with George Floyd. You know, you've got the con you have these confluence of events. You've got a failure to lead on the national level. You've got a COVID crisis, which propounds the obviousness of the failure to lead. And then on top of that, you have the continued, clear, videotaped evidence of how Black people are treated differently than white people. And I'm not saying that white people don't get treated bad, but we have, I mean, the, the bad versus what we, the bad that we suffer. You know, because let's, let's not forget about Sandra Bland. They don't want to talk about her because she died in a prison cell. Oh. But no one's addressed that. So these things happen. So so we're on a we're I think we're on an upward trajectory to doing something that's more humane. So that that is, in a nutshell, I guess, is an opening to the segue or or going into the criminal justice reform conversation. All right. Thank you so very much for that uh, attorney Perkins. Councilmember Ayers. Yes. So uh, I don't know who you wanted to go to next because uh, Todd, you hit so many nails on the head there. I mean, it's a, it's a vast array of things that we can discuss. Um, Council President, maybe we should go kick it over to Mr. Shakur. You're on mute. We can't hear you. And I know you got some stuff to say. Uh, sure. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I think it's, it's imperative that we start with the, those who are in prison. Um, you know, 
we'll look at the 90s, um, I forget the governor, where all the educational programs have even been removed uh, and, and whatnot, the impact that it, that it had on those that was, that was in prison. So again, when, when folks are not properly prepared to come home, this is, this is what we get. This is why we have the recidivism at the, at the rate that, that we have. More, more importantly, we have to also look at the, the discrepancy around race and, and, and class. Majority of, of black folks are, are incarcerated. Why is that? We're talking about poor communities, broken families. Well, um, as uh, President Councilwoman talked about earlier in her introduction, that prison and incarceration cannot be the solution. Um, but historically, we look at the 13th Amendment. The states neither slavery nor voluntary servitude shall exist except for a punishment for a crime. So as we celebrate Juneteenth of, of our emancipation, our freedom, there's those of us who are, le who are legal slaves. Um, and so as we operate with, within the system, we cannot continue to um, you know, use dividing tactics. You know, if, when I was in prison, I, w I went to prison for a crime I did not do. It was for assault. Just, just, on, that, just on that alone, many programs I, can't, I cannot uh, benefit. Why? Because I'm a sort offender. If, if we're going to approach it from a holistic way, we need to be holistic in everything. I get it, tactics and things of that nature. You know, we're trying to meet people halfway. But fundamentally, those, those human beings have been assaulted all their lives in some form or some fashion, the fact that they have not received things. But also, um, you know, looking at how the movement has changed uh, with, with inside of prison, you know, looking you know, from Malcolm X on and on. And, and I can only imagine in the 50s when he's in prison and you know, being a Muslim. And the eyes wasn't on on folks the way it is now, and those who 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 laid the, the ground were in the. And I bring that up because to organize in prison is to organize up under the gun every every day. You know, we we see what the brutality. So imagine the brutality that's not being recorded in, in, inside. So so and also thinking about our, our families. You know, I did nine years. My mama did those nine years. You know, my father is currently you know going on his thirty sixth year in prison. You know, he's he's an elder individual. Uh, how, how often we talk about criminal reform in the wake of COVID. And we saw the, the bloom of, um, of COVID inside the prisons. You know, where, where was the advocacy of getting those, those men and those women out? You know, and, and it just took a little, little bit of creativity. And also, you know, language is important. And I get in terms of you know, the word return to citizen when it, when it was born. But many of us, we call ourselves formerly incarcerated. Why we call ourselves that? Because we was incarcerated. We're, we're, we're acknowledging our past, but more important, we're acknowledging that we're human beings. We're removing the stigma, but more important, we're speaking in, in, our, in our voice to uplift our, ourselves, to wrap our, our, ourselves around our families, to be able to, to walk as whole human beings um, that w within the society. Some of us are public, some of us are private. And I'll just end it on this. Now think about the, the X-Men. And we think, of, we think about Charles Xavier and, and those five or six individuals that, that's outset world that's mutants but we forget about the others that has been rejected those who are hidden who don't who are who are not eloquent as me who haven't learned how to talk about their past without feeling ashamed and it's more of those individuals that we have to figure out how to reach how to love on and how to uplift if we talk and they have to help shape whatever you know so-called reform that we want to have so before you end i just want to ask you a question and then I'm gonna move on to um, Judge Sabri. Do you think that the criminal justice system dis discriminates against um, people of color? Absolutely discriminates against black men, against yes. black women, against black trans, uh, against black kids. I mean, it's, it's, built with, it's built within the system. And the sad thing, even those who look like us because they're part of, of the system uh, per perpetuate it. Again, my, my case is, is exemplifies it. Everybody that testified against me said I wasn't there. But unfortunately, Judge Townsend, because of the stereotype that he saw, he saw of me, he threw me away. He thought it would, it would better be served to have me locked up for nine years, you know, with having planned $40,000 where that, that money could have been reinvested in, in something else. And it wasn't for my father who helped rehabilitate me. I would not be the man I am today. All right, thank, thank you for that. So I'm gonna go back on that question to you, Judge. And so what do you think the criminal justice um, system can do to um, to address discriminating against people of color, and also, do you think the criminal justice system? Um, what 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 do you think the opportunities are 
for innovation in our criminal justice system, such as the diversion courts and um, the alternatives to incarceration. So what do you, it's a two part question. What do you think the system can do? And you're a judge, I don't have to repeat it. Yeah. So, go ahead on Judge Horton. So first I wanna say thank you for having me this morning and happy Juneteenth to everybody. Um, thank you for having me on. A lot of times people forget that third branch of government the judicial branch when we're talking about criminal justice reform. They only think about the judges when they're before them. So I appreciate you having me here for this part. Um, I'll start with the discrimination question first. Um, a lot of times you don't know who it is you're electing or putting in place. Um, some people just go to the ballot and just check, oh, that, not, that name sounds nice or that person's been here already. So I think one way is to pay, and it's, and it's laborious, but to pay more attention and to investigate and to do more to understand who it is that you're putting in power in these positions, especially in the city of Detroit, where we are 80 plus percent black city, we need people who represent us. So one way is to study a little bit more, a little bit harder who it is you're putting in office. Just because someone is of color doesn't mean that they're for you either. I have to remind people of that. And, um, and just a little information on that also, here at 36th District Court now, every hearing that we have because of COVID-19 is virtual on YouTube. So this one way, an action item for people to be able to see how people or how judges are treating our own citizens. So that's one way to be more informed as to who it is that's in our office. Um, it's a harder question as far as just you have these outright racists. That's a long answer to that. I, I don't think I can get to that today. But um, for the other question about innovation and ways to change the criminal justice system from a judge's perspective we have to follow the law so the first issue i always have with frustration is what the law is and judge uh sorry todd perkins mentioned or or touched on that we have laws where okay so res resisting and obstructing in michigan you can get up to 20 years for so if you resist the police we have the power as judges to put you in jail for 20 years potentially so one issue is the legislature and getting rid of several laws that are, in my opinion, unfair. And I'm on the traffic docket here at 36th District Court. It is a crime if you don't have your registration on you. You can go to jail up to 93 days. It's a crime if you don't have your insurance. It's a crime if you don't have your license on you. 93 days is the max. It's a crime if you forget your license. I know we've all done that. We could go to jail for 93 days for that. So. Just on that end, there are several laws that need to be changed do not, that don't allow for us to incarcerate people for such traffic offenses. But as far as innovation, one thing we're doing at the courts or we're trying to do um, nationwide is create alternative sentencing solutions. So I have, we have four pilot courts here at uh, 36 where, well, I'm, well, first of all, just to be clear, I do not incarcerate I'm on a traffic docket. I don't believe that anyone should go to jail for a traffic offense. That's just my stance. It'll always be that way. But there are some who feel that they have the ability to do it. It's been, it's habit. And sometimes it, it takes certain things to break habit. So um, we are trying to bring in a program where instead of someone not having their registration or license and putting them in jail, we ask them, you know, what's going on? Do you have housing? Are you at risk for homelessness? Do you have a job? Do you have a resume? And we take them through all these different steps and we bring them back and review with them what's going on. And then they end up getting their license in the end and they didn't go to jail and they won't come before us again for the same thing. So that's some of the stuff that we're doing. We have a mental health court or we have homelessness court. We have street court. We're starting our human trafficking court. So we are trying to do several things to divert from people going to jail because I do not believe with the way that our system is working now, incarceration is the answer. Our jails are not set up to rehabilitate anybody. Thank you. No, oh, um, thank you, Judge Sabri. And, and I share uh, your, your thoughts and your opinions on traffic violation shouldn't be um, a measure for us to be incarcerated because I know I tell y'all, literally yesterday, I walked out and didn't have my license. I did too but, this week. Did, and so if I just had to come before a judge that wasn't as understanding as you, then your council member would have been in jail for 93 days. And that is just 
absolutely ridiculous. And so I appreciate uh, your ability to see through all of this and see the things that that need to be that need to happen. Um, Council President, I've had an opportunity to work on some things recently um, with our former rep Santana. Um, and it would be great if Harvey, if you could speak to a few of those things that we've been working on and uh, just kind of give an update on where we are with it. Great. So uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. I'm happy to be here with you and thank you for having me. Um, let me do a couple of things first. Let me kind of give you a global perspective of what's been happening in the state as it relates to criminal justice reform, going back to when I started in the state legislature to get you to where you're at today. When I first arrived in 2011, one of the first things that my former boss, our former governor, uh, Rick Snyder did was he defunded what's called the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative from $50 million to $20 million. So when you look at this very successful program that was created under Jennifer Granholm and look at to what it is today, it's a shell of its former self. So when you look at that and then you look at all of the other things that have happened uh, consequently, um, there's been an awakening in America. And here's the awakening. There's a push-pull dynamic. On one hand, we have industries telling us that we can't find people to hire, but then we have a country that says we don't want undocumented people in the country to fulfill those jobs. But then in the middle, you have an entire population of people who, by virtue of them being sentenced, are unemployable by our own definition. And at the same time, you add a layer of that, of tax breaks, these big companies that come in and they build these big buildings and then they tell you well you know we really can't hire your people because we have these guidelines so what we're doing is we're self-discriminating against ourselves by virtue of the things that we do and we pass into law number one number two the the other part of the awakening has been is that the conservative movement i'm talking about republicans have realized that putting felonies on people's heads and making them pay this you know perpetuitous charge of having a felony is as a disaster to the economy okay because of the unemployability factor in that so what we've seen is a series of changes of bills that try to address these issues but what's happening is that there's no real recognition of the mistakes that happened in the past the mistake being is that during the 1980s during the massive prison industrial buildup is that what we said what we're going to do is we're going to lock them up we're going to throw them away and we're going to get rid of our problems well guess what they're returning to our community and they're not returning to our community in the way that we want them to return to our community in it's called department of corrections so they should have been corrected but they can't be corrected because the programming isn't in place for them to achieve the certain things that need to achieve so with that, what has happened when I was there, we started uh, an initiative to uh, change HIDA, the Home Youthful Trainee Act, because we are one of, or were one of three states that still try sentence and convicted 17-year-olds uh, as adults. Now what we've done is said, no, we're gonna keep them in the county jails until the age of uh, criminal jurisdiction, which is 21, because we don't want to send children to an adult prison, number one, number two. We've also uh, put several changes in place to what's called good moral character clauses. So you had somebody who uh, did their time, did seven years, comes out, achieves some type of certificate, they try to start a business and they can't because the licensing board says, you don't have good moral character because you held up a liquor store. So we changed those types of laws and those laws continue to be changed today. The other thing that we tried to do when I was there was uh, address expungement. Uh, it's a big issue and today we have a, clean slate uh, bill package um, in the Senate Judiciary that's currently being debated out. Um, we also are now moving in a direction of what's called productivity credits. As you know, uh, because of the truth and sentencing guidelines, we don't have, no longer have uh, good time credits. So what we're trying to do is put something in place in, in law that says, if you go through these programs, if you work, if you achieve this type of education, if you achieve all these things, what it does is it takes time off of your sentence. And so we're trying to deal with all of those bills at the same time. Um, one of the other things that I would like to um, address in terms of what the judge said, and she raised a very valid point, part of the problem with the lawmaking is that there's a big disconnect 
between legislators and judges. And the only time we see a judges association is when they don't like something. We don't see judges when they want to see the changes happen and that push isn't coming from the judges. What we see is the push against something that the legislature is trying to do. So there's really no reinforcement uh, of the policy issue. Um, and I grappled with that, like in the raise the age, because what happens is the associations will tell us, well, we don't want the legislator uh, telling the judges what to do. We want discretion. Okay, fine. So then you always have this push-pull battle in, in the legislature regarding that issue. And it's, it's frustrating because I hear you and there's things that we should change, but there's always 13 more layers of what you have to go through. Um, so with that, oh, one last thing. Um, and for council members and for those who are interested in this latest CARES Act budget, uh, Senate Bill 690, if you look, I think it's on page 14, what I effectively lobbied for with the um, Alliance for Safety and Justice was funding for, for up to $4 million uh, uh, for grants for up to $50,000 for domestic violence shelters and or um, institutions that do this type of work in the wake of COVID. So what we have now is uh, a pot of money, $4 million at the state where those entities that um, deal with domestic violence and have needs because COVID, you know, shot their budgets up, uh, they now have an ability to secure that money to keep the keep their operation going. Um, and I can send you the bill if you'd like later on so you can see it. Um, but it's a pretty long uh, section. I think it's section 402, if I'm not mistaken. So with that, I'll digress because I know we got others. Oh, well, sorry. One last thing. When it comes to the prison population, you got to look at this in a very simple way. We can design all the laws you want to reduce the prison population uh, from, from the state level. But at the local level, there's a counter argument. Then stop sending them here. So the jails task force that has been led by Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist has been looking at an entire series of decriminalization bills to take things from felonies to misdemeanors, from misdemeanors to civil infractions. And the one thing that COVID, I think, revealed is that we over-incarcerated. In Wayne County, we had approximately, what, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Judge, 13, 1,400 people incarcerated on any given day. Yep. Now we're somewhere at about 800 people. Yep, that's correct. So why did we have 600 people in jail sitting there for what? So, and, and, and not just to put Wayne County on spot, but if you look at Macomb County, Oakland County, Washtenaw County, Kent County, Ottawa, all around the state, what you saw was the same trend. Mm -hmm. The question we have to ask is, who needs to go to jail and who are we mad at? And there's a distinctive difference here. So with that, now I digress. Uh, Council President, I just want to make sure that um, I highlight something uh, that will be coming up in our formal session on Tuesday. So I am sponsoring a resolution uh, that supports House Bills 4980, 4981, 82, 83, 84, 85, and 5120. And all of those uh, go with the expungement and the clean slate package. And so what that will do, uh, I'll give the bigger overview on Tuesday, but um, that is coming. And that is coming from your municipal leaders saying that, hey, we support this. Um, I tried to testify last Thursday and this past Thursday, um, but it was so many people there speaking out for the change that needs to be seen um, from our state level that it was just, it was too many people to even get through to do the testimony. So uh, that is coming from our body on, on Tuesday. Thank you for that. Um... Council Member Ears, I will be coasting up during that. Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind joining you with that. And I agree, um, and, and I agree with what everyone has said. I mean, I think this is an awesome panel, uh, especially for the day, June 10th, I'm, I'm sorry, June 10th, that it is, it's an awesome panel. And the things that we're talking about today are so relevant to all these people that's just sitting in prison that should not be sitting there. And so I just thank this panel for everything that you have added and all of your expertise 
in what you're doing. And, and I thank you also, uh, Mr. Santana, as a former state rep, because as you, as you know, also often, we do say what the judges are and are doing, but we never ask the lawmakers take an, take an opportunity sit, to sit and have conversation with the judges. And so I thank you as well. And I thank you for every role that you have played. Um, since I've known you, you've played quite a few, you've worn quite a few hats and you've been good in all the hats that you have worn. So thank you, always active um, and always doing something to help others. So thank you for everything that you do as well. Uh, so I just have a question that I would like to have everyone answer. And that is, how can those who are interested in joining the fight for criminal justice reform get involved? At first, you can start off with Councilmember Ayers Task Force. That's my response. But I'd like to hear you all respond. If I could jump in. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, that's first and foremost. I mean, when you join and when you get involved in these kind of programs, you know, the people are right here. I, I, Shakur, if you call him or e email him, and, and Santana, if you call him and email him, I guarantee you they will give a, a, a litany of things that you can do today. I mean, it, it is something that's ready and waiting. It's, it's there for us to access. I mean, this fight is real. If you call Consul, Councilwoman Ayers' office, I guarantee you she's got a list of things that she's got a to-do list for anyone who wants to access this. Because, you know, you know if you go to uh, uh, some of these uh, protests, and if you go to the protests, you, you, know, you know, it's almost like that statement that says, you know, your parents used to say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You know, you go to these things and, and, and you'll be around people who are involved in this because these people on this panel right here are down there. You know, I, I'm one of the few that I have to admit, I have been in this office because I'm doing these Zoom hearings and I have actually have a Zoom hearing for an incarcerated brother that starts at 10 o'clock today. And you know, the MDOC is so draconian and if you don't sign on, then you've kind of failed your opportunity. I mean, those kind of things that I'm just sick of, but nonetheless, the, the ability to access, and now that we have the internet, now that we have Facebook, now that we have uh, you know, Instagram, rather than using it for the entertainment purposes that we've been using it for, just touch these people and these brothers and sisters who are in the fight. You know, Ms. We Ms. Wesley, all of these people have ways to direct us. And sometimes there's certain things you want to do. Just like I believe uh, Brother Shakur was into talking about, what do I do now that I'm out? You know, what do I do, not only from a perspective of getting a job, but how do I decompress having been having my, my manhood, my, my, my humanhood taken from me unnecessarily? And he talking about Townsend. Townsend was a guy that, I mean, I've I seen him give guys a, 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 a hundred years and say, have a nice day with a smile. I mean, that kind of thing that, you know, you know, at least have some compassion Maybe somebody deserves 10 years. And that's not for me to say, because I don't never want to be a judge. I, I don't want to live with that, that thing. It's just, I, I couldn't do it. But nonetheless, to say, have a nice day. I mean, that's what you are in front of. So I know what he went through. I wasn't there for him and I wasn't there around it, but I know exactly what he went through. And he's talking about, he's, he's been able to have a support network that got him to the point where he can express himself. It, it, these brothers being, and sisters being able to express themselves is the start of, of, of removing the pain and the chattel of that, you know, uh, uh, slavery, as he described, because he, he's continued to be enslaved in some way, shape or form, because he's not going to be a citizen. So I know that it went a little bit beyond, but, you know, there's so much access for people if they want to be involved, you know, if, you know, just, just type up on Facebook and they're going to call you back. <laughs> Okay. Who's next? So I'll, I'll add real quick. Um, if I didn't tell you I've been to prison, you would never know. We don't necessarily know what, what that, that individual or that person or people look, look like. Um, again, if you just look at my resume, hey, I just graduated from the University of Michigan School of Social Work. And prior to that, I just graduated from the University of um, Dearborn. And I've, I've, I opened up a, a bookstore in my, my neighborhood. I just, just completed... Um, 
we rehab an abandoned house to a community center. We, we, we've operated an um, annual backpack for 15 years. And not none of these things as an individual, but what we do collectively, right? And so what we know about mass incarceration, it has impacted every one of us in some form or some fashion over the last 20, 30, 40 years. You know, our fathers, our mothers, our friends, et cetera, et cetera. So the biggest thing that we can begin to do is re remove that stigma. I can remember as a child going to class and, and they asking the question, hey, what, do you what about your father? And I didn't know how to talk about that because my father was in prison. And, and there's so many of us uh, in, in that way. And I'll just conclude on this. Um, this is not just a, a man thing. This is a woman's thing as well. And, and, and how we use, uh, you know, continue to perpetuate you know, sexism in, in that form. You know, you, you, you uplift me for my story, but do we also uplift women for their stories? For the for the sexual and physical physical abuse that they that they have experienced. So again, we have to create a holistic approach to this. But more important, we have to get behind those who are incarcerated and those who come on, the men, the women, the trans, and and the families, the mothers, the fathers, and the babies. Council President, let me can I jump in right there uh, because uh, Yusuf, what you just said was was spot on, and I think that gets lost in a lot of the conversations. A lot of times people look at it just from a male perspective, but when you talk about the women that are incarcerated or come from being incarcerated, there aren't halfway houses that want to deal with women because of all the other things that go with it, right? And so as a woman, people say, oh, well, go to, go to Cots or go here or go there. I don't have my kids, so I can't go there. So now where does that leave me? That leaves me in a space where I find myself vulnerable to be around maybe some man that I don't need to be with again. Maybe I find myself doing some things I would normally not have done. So it's so many different levels to this whole criminal justice reform conversation. We've got to talk about the things that lead up to situations that make a person vulnerable to be a part of the criminal justice system. It, it's so multifaceted, but it's good to have the conversations, but it's even more important to put the conversation into action. So I'm so thankful for all of you that are here. I'm sad to say that, Councilor. Thank you. Harvey, you on mute. I see. You. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll go. The first thing I'm going to say is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. The second thing I'm going to say is wake up and pay attention to what's going on and make careful observation. If you look at all these protests from one end of this country to the other end of, of, of the world, what you will see is that the protesters aren't senior citizen African Americans marching down Woodward singing Negro spirituals led by the NAACP. These are young people. These are white people who grew up in the suburbs, who grew up in cul-de-sacs, who grew up at these kitchen tables listening to the conversations. They went off to college and realized that the world was a bigger place. Now they came back here, figured out that Obama was a president, Eminem was a rapper, and Mike Duggan's a mayor. The world done changed, and so they see things differently. And these injustices that we're seeing on TV now has created another awakening because they know that change has to come. In the legislature, they know that change is coming. The problem is there's going to be what's called the okie doke pretty soon, and you all know what it is. Black folk have been sending representation to Lansing since 1893 when William Ferguson was first elected. We don't need another task force, commission, work group, study session to tell you what's wrong. Read the Kerner Commission report that was written back when the riots were, 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 were happening, okay? It'll tell you everything you need to know. So what we need to do is organize all of the ideas, all of the solutions, and make a consistent platform that says this is what we need. The one thing I will say about the protesters that met with the, with the mayor, at least they had a platform. Whether you agreed with it or not, they had a platform. They know what they want. You have to force your way into the table. And the other thing is learn the process. A lot of people think, well, we're going to go rally in Lansing, yell and scream, take over the Capitol, and then we're going to go home. That doesn't do it. We just go to lunch, we'll go grab a beer, we'll come back, and once you're done, you're done, we'll go doing what we gotta do. You have to remain consistent. And that has been the power of the protest. They're not letting up. And the last thing, um, uh, and I guess that was the last thing, don't fall for the okie doke. Don't let them say, well, we need to form a commission and then they're gonna get the same typical people that you see from every nonprofit, from every foundation, from every church, from, from the, the normal business community. Get new leadership. 
go into that crowd of protesters and find intelligent people who know how to communicate and have a background and know how to organize and know, know what to ask for and, and let them start doing this process. We keep relying on the same typical leadership that's gotten us in the situation we're in. Thank you. That'll get me in trouble, I guarantee you that. Uh, right, right. Can I just say one thing very quickly, Council President. Um, everything that Harvey, Todd, and Yusuf said is I agree with. And I just ask that everyone remember to also vote. Do not neglect voting in all of this. And your local elections, in my opinion, are more important or just as important, but please do not neglect to vote for president either. But um, in all of this fight, you have to understand that your leadership matters, as Harvey just said. You gotta get the right leadership in there because otherwise this won't mean anything. They'll just ignore it. All the protests and won't mean anything. Agreed. I want to um, turn it over to the council member. I, I agree with all that you have said. I wanna turn it over to council member Ayers as we leave with closing remarks. I don't know if we had anyone with any questions, but I did not see any hands up. And that's why I continued on, but I did not ask if there were anyone on Facebook that had any questions. Jalen, uh, do you all see anyone that has any Facebook questions or? Were there any Facebook questions? Um, I don't see any as of now. Okay, all right. And I don't see any hands up. So member Ears, if you want to go with your closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Again, uh, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to participate um, and, and just integrating the task force into this conversation. Um, like you said, it's all about partnership. And that's one of the things that I've heard as a resonating throughout each of our conversations is that it's gonna take partnership. It's going to take for us to get together of like minds and move an agenda forward that makes sense. Um, Yusuf said something earlier that, you know, I normally talk about it all the time. I, when we talk, when we talk about criminal justice reform, there is so much layered inside of that because for me, I'm sitting in front of you now as an at-large council member, but I'm also the daughter of a multi-felon, if you will. He spent the majority of my life locked up. And so when we talk about the reform, it's so many pieces that it touches because I could have been a completely different person. And if it wasn't for my mother being a hands-on parent, and uh, making sure that she kept me in the right direction, I would be somewhere else. And so I say all of that because so many kids are just like me. So many kids didn't know how to talk about their mother or their father or whatever because they had a parent that was incarcerated. Or when their parent came out, your parent felt some kind of way. My dad felt some kind of way because he couldn't provide for my sister and I. He couldn't provide for himself. But that's because there were so many barriers that are still there so the reform has to come in so many different levels. And I'm so glad to have so many of us here that are touching on those levels. Uh, I would like to make sure that the public knows, you know, Detroit did ban the box on all of our applications uh, years ago. We moved forward two years ago uh, from my office with the Fair Chance Housing Ordinance because people don't understand that when you get out, you need to have somewhere to live. If you don't have somewhere to lay your head then what does that do to your person, to your psyche, to just your, your human qualities? And so we did that. And so if anybody that's listening needs to get more information about the Fair Chance Housing Ordinance, please contact my office, 313-224-4248, uh, because they can't discriminate against you because you have a record. You deserve to have a fair chance to have somewhere to lay your head. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful for the partners that are here. And I'm thankful that we're having the conversation and I'm thankful that we're looking at it from different levels because like I, I said to you all, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I was an angry kid because I didn't know what to do with that. And in communities of color, we don't talk about what to do with that anger as a kid. You don't talk about how to really address it. So you're out here and as a former teacher, I knew I had kids in my classroom and whose parents were incarcerated just like mine was. And that's why you were acting out. You act the fool because you know what to do with your emotions. And so I, I just go back to my original point that we have to reform this thing on so many different levels because it touches too many different pieces. And again, I'm thankful for all of you. Thank you, Council President, for letting me be a part of this conversation this morning. Thank you for 
agreeing to be a part of this conversation. A lot of times you can ask someone to do something and they say, uh, no, thank you. But <laughs> so thank you for agreeing to be a part of the conversation and thank all of you for agreeing to be a part of this conversation. There is still a lot of work to do. I was on council when the ordinance was passed to ban the box. And one of the things that, you know, I have constantly fought for as well as with it not being on our applications with, I fight that it's not on anybody's application if they're doing business with the city of Detroit. Right. Everyone should have that fair chance. Once you have done your time, give them an opportunity. Cause a lot of times when you get that application and they check that box, that application goes straight into the garbage can. So don't ask to even have that box on there. Give them that fair chance. And anyone that does business with the city of Detroit, I fight that they don't have that box on their application. And so I, I think that's so important. I want to, and I want to do this publicly because I am so proud of Judge Aaliyah Sabri. And I say that and I give her these compliments because she too sat I'm in the chambers with me as a liaison for the mayor. And she's always said to me, I want to be a judge. I want to be a judge. And it doesn't seem like it's been that long. And look at where she is now. And what that says is there's nothing that's too big for you to do and for you to be if you believe that you can do it. And so I had to publicly say just how proud of a Judge Shabui I am. Because I never thought she said I want to be a judge, but I didn't think it would happen just that quick as she sat there as a liaison for the mayor's office. So I'm really proud of you, and I'm and I'm proud to say that you are a fair judge as well. So thank you for everything that you do, um, Judge Sabri. A lot of times we get so high up till we sit inside a glass house, and, and we don't all say that. Every last one of us probably have had someone in our family who has been incarcerated. And saying that everyone should try to get involved in criminal reform in some way or the other. There is a way you can get involved. Even if you, again, start off reaching to one of the people that you see on this panel who you know is interested in criminal reform. You don't even have to think about it. You see Judge Sabri, you see Harvey Santana, you see uh, uh, Attorney Todd Perkins, you see Yusuf Shakur, you see Council Member Ayers, and she has a task force. You see myself. And so you know there is a way that you can get involved. There is no reason why everybody does not to get involved with this criminal reform issue that we're talking about today. I want to end, but I want to say before I end to all of the men, happy Father's Day. If you do not have any biological uh, children, I know you have mentored some child somewhere. Happy Father's Day to all of you and thank all of you for everything you do. I also want us to leave with one last thing, and everybody knows how important to me it is, as I was one that tested positive with COVID-19, wear your mask when you're out there. Be safe. Continue to keep the person that's in your space safe as well, so that they don't take anything home to their family. You don't take anything home to your family. Put that mask on your face. Again, I wanna thank all of you all for joining me. I wanna thank all of you all for everything that you do. Thank you, Ms. Blake, for all that you do as well. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all and continuing to do everything I can do to assist with criminal reform. You said thank you for everything you do out in the community. You are active and you are always out there as well doing so much. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, I appreciate all of you all. Did anyone want to just say anything before we end? Because it is 10.07 and we normally end at 10, but I didn't want to 
take any closing remarks from anyone if they had something they just wanted to leave with. Okay, seeing none, and you guys know I cheer how fast I cheer. That council meeting, thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you, uh, Tony Todd Perkins, for everything you do as well, and all of the people that you help out here. God bless each and every one of you. Have a, a safe weekend. Thank you, Team Jones, for everything that you always do. Member ears, I know we'll go back and forth with this, but I'm going to say I have the best team because I have the mic now. And I know you're going to say you have the best team when you have the mic. But I say our team together works good together. And so thank you, member ears, for all you do. Thank your team for all that they do. And thank Team Jones. I love you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chris, for interpreting. Happy Father's Day.